for many of you to this event. Um, Institute and Society published in the 2020s, What Can We Do For Ourselves? Um, which I guess is an event on how we historians can take control of how we communicate. Um, I'm James Baker, I'm from the University of Sussex and I'm the chair of this event and I'm, I'm delighted to be chairing a really wonderful panel. Um, I'll just very briefly go through the panel are in order um, and then I'll let them get on with their, their short contributions. So first of all we'll have Karen Wolfe who's from the Omohundro Institute at William and Mary College. Um, we'll then hand over to Philip Carter from the Institute of Historical Research. Um, we'll then hand over to Tyler Parry from the University of Nevada, um, Las Vegas. Um, and then we'll hand over to Catherine Kelly, who's also um, here waving, there you go. I just noticed people started waving, so I thought I'd give you a pause for that. Um, who's um, one of Karen's colleagues. And then finally, we'll turn to James Grossman from the American Historical Association. Do you wanna give us a wave as well? No, okay. Um, each member of the panel will speak for around five minutes and it's basically my job at that point to keep them to time. Um, so if you see me furiously waving, um, that's what I'm doing. Um, after that, we're gonna have about 15 to 20 minute panel um, discussion with the full panel, followed by about 20 minutes of Q&A with the audience. We've got quite a um, compressed schedule. Um, to keep things simple in terms of your contributions, those of you who are um, attending the event, um, if you have a question, um, the best thing you can do is type these out and stick them in the chat. You can either put them in the general chat or you can direct them directly to me. Um, what I'm then going to do is try and group these kind of questions together and then ask the panel to respond to groups of questions based on themes that emerge. Um, I should also say at this point that this event is being recorded. Um, so you should see that a recorded icon and pop up. Um, if you have any questions about the recording of this event, my um, advice would be to direct them to the IHR. So IHR events at assas.ac.uk. Okay, um, so now the prelim preliminaries are over, um, I'm gonna pass over to Karen to briefly outline what this partnership to the IHR and the Omohondro Institute is all about, and indeed the thinking behind this event, this joint event on digital publishing. So, Karen. Thanks so much, James. It's great to be here. Can you all hear me okay? My Wi-Fi has, it's just perfect timing for it to be a little wobbly this morning. It's morning here. Um, so I'm glad that you can hear me okay. Uh, so the Omohundro Institute is um, uh, dedicated to the study of early American history writ large. We say four centuries and four continents. Um, it is vast early America indeed. We publish a journal, the William & Mary Quarterly. We also publish books with our press partners, the University of North Carolina Press. We are funders, we support scholars with um, research fellowships and we host a variety of events. And we're really thrilled to be partnering with the Institute for Historical Research on a variety of programs this year. Um, delighted to have met with Joe and Philip um, last year back when we were all doing things in person um, and designing some, some cool programs that we think will really take advantage of the fact that we are institutes. So, uh, so today what we're talking about is how institutes and societies can think about their publishing programs, whether we need to always be thinking about whether publishing needs to scale up, or if in fact, right sizing maybe, or maybe even small scale is the right way to go for societies and institutes. So a little bit of background on that from the Omohundro side. Um, I have been writing and my colleagues at the Omohundro Institute have been writing for a number of years about the kinds of information that helps us as humanities societies to understand um, our work as publishers in the wider world in which humanities and history are not really the main thing. That is, I think all of us are highly aware that uh, STEM publishing, which is the highest volume and the highest dollar is really driving a lot of what's happening in scholarly communications and not always for the good. That is that we are very aware that our colleagues in STEM are doing great work, but that doesn't mean that the kind of highly commercialized and very high cost publishing is suitable for the way we work, nor does it mean that the work processes are suitable for us. So I'm just gonna put in the chat um, one of the pieces that um, we shared on our blog several years ago that helps to make, I think, a very important point from our vantage, which is that 
when we are publishing independently, we can really understand the costs of publishing. One of the black boxes in scholarly communication is how much does it really cost to do this work? But because we employ our editorial staff, we pay for our position on platforms, we pay our typesetter, we can tell you about paper. There are moments in the office when we are looking and comparing paper colors to make sure we've got the same cover from issue to issue. We have the capacity to understand what it costs and that's very important because what we can show is that this is really low cost but incredibly high value to scholars and the public at large. Now I want to very quickly before James boots me so in, <laughs> and we move on to Philip, I want to quickly also share with you um, some information about a publishing platform that we designed. Um, let me see if I can get this. Here we go. I'm going to go to my share screen and I want to play from the start. There we go. Okay. Um, so several years ago, we started working on something called the OI Reader, which was um, the first scholarly journal in iTunes. We're very pleased about that. Um, we did from 2014 to 2019, we published the OI Reader using um, an Adobe product, digital publishing suite. And our goal here was to, and this goes to my point about it doesn't always have to scale up and using low cost things. We went with a commercial project, uh, product that we knew was going to be relatively sustainable and a company that we knew had a long lifespan. Adobe gave us the gift of this digital publishing suite and also some really wonderful tech know-how and helped our colleagues in-house, including our then tech coordinator, Kim Foley, to put what was our digital humanities content and our journal on this app. Um, it was a fantastic project and we were very pleased with how it worked. This is an example of um, Josh Piker, the editor, announcing in 2018 that we had published our first journal article that appeared only on the Reader app because it was so highly digital. There was so much content in it. This was Simon Newman's article hidden in plain sight about Jamaica and Jamaica um, enslaved people. Um, we have just rolled out this year, um, just a couple of months ago, the beta version of the OI Reader 2.0, which we've now built on WordPress. Um, it is a web-based app. As the world between apps and uh, websites grows ever more murky, I don't know if anybody else knows what the difference is between their web-based app for Slack and being online with Slack. I know that I'm perpetually confused. Um, but it is a web-based app, which means it has a great mobile experience, and it also has the discoverability of being on the web. It's more permeable, essentially. So the new OI Reader can do some things that the old OI Reader did, but it also has enhanced discoverability and some of the virtues of being accessible from, um, from a laptop or desktop environment. So very quickly, I'm just going to show you a couple of things about the OI Reader because my colleague Kathy Kelly is going to tell you a few more things. Um, we have an, an open section where we have digital humanities projects. We ask readers to log in and create an account, but it's free. A lot of material is free. There's some stuff that's for, um, for subscribers, low cost. Let me just repeat that. Um, but we have digital humanities projects, including we've converted Simon's project over to the new OI Reader. This is what a traditional issue of our journal looks like on the reader. It um, typically, we all know what a print journal looks like. You open the front cover and you've got a very nice table of contents there. And then you've got, um, but here, this is what the table of contents looks like for the April. Ooh, that is my, that's my timer telling me I'm up. My time is up. Let me go one more thing, show you one more thing. Um, uh, this is, uh, uh, the Jenny Shaw's In the Name of the Mother. What I wanted to point out to you is that there are tools in the app that allow you to do things like create highlights, which I've done here over on the side, and also to show the footnotes. You can highlight a section of text and it'll pop up what the footnote is over here on the side. There are a few other fancy features that uh, the OI Reader has, and I can tell you that from my vantage, it's a really lovely and elegant reading environment. That's the key thing. How can we actually do the kind of deep reading that historians, that scholars want, but do it in a digital environment? That can be tough. So that's, uh, that's it from me. And I will now hand back the baton. I'm not sure how we do clapping on Zoom, but we can do a bit of <laughs> clapping, can't we? Thank um, you, Philip. I accept it. <laughs>
unmute myself. I just shared my screen so you can see that. Um, just uh, before I begin, just to say thank you to Karen for uh, making this collaboration possible with the IHR and the Oma Hundra. It's wonderful to be in partnership with you. Um, and welcome to everyone for joining us uh, today. It's a, it's a very good start to this uh, collaboration. Uh, like Karen, I'm going to talk about a particular project, the Humanities Digital Library, uh, which has involved the Institute over the last couple of years. Um, and to think very simply about what it can do um, and how it's really changing the life of the Institute. Um, like the Omohundro, the IHR at the University of London is multidimensional. It does many things, fellowships, academic research, projects, uh, and including publishing. We have a journal and we have a long tradition of publishing academic books uh, that we're developing now through the digital library, focusing particularly on open access publishing, which is the main driver for this. And I'll say a little bit about this now. Um, I'm going to pause three times in my presentation to sort of reflect very, very briefly and raise some broader points, which hopefully will then be developed in the discussion. So we move away from simply a narrative about the project uh, that I'm talking about today. So the Humanities Digital Libraries uh, was started in 2016 um, and it's built on Open Monograph Press, uh, part of the Public Knowledge Project. Um, and it was, it's very modestly funded. Uh, we got a grant that allowed it to be built uh, by an external developer um, and to employ one person who was going to get the project off the ground and to start seeding it with content. What we now have um, is a... Um, a form of uh, publishing, uh, very simple displays of uh, monograph publishing. Um, we've been joined by other institutes across the University of London, not just the Institute of Historical Research. And if I take uh, the opportunity to look at just one example of a, an IHR, recent IHR monograph publication, uh, you can see that um, this is the top half of the page. We offer access to free open access PDF. Uh, we also publish in print. Uh, an ebook, and the other part of the page allows people to make uh, connections from individual chapters through to JSTOR, uh, which is our way round of dealing with the problems that the OMP platform provides um, in terms of not being able to link at chapter level. So we've had that work round for JSTOR, and we're pretty happy with what we're able to do now in terms of that uh, connectivity. The motivation really for the um, the whole project came from a partnership between the Institute of Historical Research and the Royal Historical Society here in the UK, who wanted to begin a new publishing programme for early career historians, a distinctly open access monograph programme, um, and the platform was built for that purpose. And these are some of the titles that we published recently and are going on to publish um, through the remainder of 2020. Um, and so, in a way, that was the real starting point for the thinking about taking on uh, both a new series and a new way of publishing that series. But then subsequently, we looked at what we did at the Institute. We have a long tradition, as I said, of publishing in print. Um, we retrospectively um, made available as open access uh, all of our titles that existed in pre-existing series. The conference series that you see here in purple is one of them. And then we started to also think about other ways that we might publish. So one of the, the outcomes of thinking and using the platform has been to think about different forms of publishing. One of, the, one of the key initiatives we developed is something called IHR Shorts, which is to sort of break away from the idea that everything has to be either 10,000 words or 90,000 words. And to ask a very simple question, which is what history haven't we written that was actually meaningful at 30,000 words or 40,000 words. And that's an interesting debate I think we can probably develop um, coming up. So my first interlude in this will be to mention that the motivation for what we're doing is open access. Um, that we've really changed over the last few years how we use the platform. We've moved from initially thinking that we would host external content from other publishers to looking at what we do and, and thinking hard about our back catalogue and the formats like the shorts. I think the key thing here is that we are taking it as an opportunity to think about what we could do and what's not being done. Um, and I think to go back to Karen's point, um, the idea of small is very important here because it allows to be, us to be experimental, to try things that may work like the shorts or they may not. And we're, we're interested in finding whether that's got resonance with the academic community. In terms of what's worked and not worked, I think one of the, you know, one of the challenges has been the short titles insofar that um, we've had a limited take up in the number of academics that want to write at that length, 30, 40,000 words. And it's interesting whether that will develop over time or whether, you know, this, the existing models are so dominant, um, both here in, in the UK and the US. 
and as I mentioned, we, we've had to develop certain workarounds also for, um, uh, for linking through to chapter level material. If I move on now to say a little bit about outcomes of the platform, um, this is a, a chart that shows the uh, downloads. We've had about 160,000 downloads since uh, August 2018 when we started recording them. And you can see the charts, blue is 2018 to 19, orange is 2019 to 2020 through to July 2020. You can see there are broad trends, um, the rise and fall across the academic year. I think what, what's striking here is the rise um, in the past four or five months, which is not surprising at all in terms of downloads, the rise in the orange uh, bar um, from February, March 2020 onwards. And I think one question to come back to uh, when we come to the discussion will be what is the impact of this year in particular on some of the themes that we're talking about. I mean, we're, we're, we're working in distinctive times and that's really one of the reasons for having this particular discussion now. In terms of regional spread, um, we are attracting re downloads and readers um, in a much wider geographical range than we ever did in print. Um, and we're also able, I think now that we're able to divide material in terms of chapters, we're able to be much more flexible and fluid in terms of dissemination of material. So attaching particular chapters in books, we've got 26 books, IHR books on the platform now, dividing in individual chapters, 300 chapters in total, to fit particular episodes that are going on in terms of anniversaries or things. And we did a, we did a, a chapter for the day through uh, the uh, main period of lockdown uh, here in the UK. So my second interlude would say um, accessibility and reach. Things seem positive, but we are in two years into the program. Um, with metrics that are other than profit making or, or, or based on money, uh, it's often hard to know how well we're doing. How well are these numbers? Uh, are we doing well enough? The trend seems to be up but um, it's very hard to measure that. I think one of the obvious problems that we all face here, and we've faced it with a new platform and a new series, is discoverability. We've relied heavily on the IHR and the RHS name recognition and the move to a new University of London press uh, in 2020. Um, and we rely very heavily on JSTOR as a way of accessing about 75% of our downloads come through JSTOR. So discoverability as opposed to accessibility is a very important uh, question. And just to finish, um, I want to say a little bit about what we've done in the last um, couple of months, because I do think this is a really distinctive time. Um, one consequence of the platform has allowed us to look back at our back catalogue. So we digitised with the help of the University of London Press, a number of titles that were in print, but were, had sort of passed their, their peak um, and are able to revive them. This is one of them, a guide to records in the National Archives here at the UK. And we've taken that further over the summer and developed and gone quite a long way back in terms of our publishing uh, records. So we're drawing now on material from the 1990s and 1980s um, and giving it a new life on the platform, which I think is important. And then finally, I think one of the things that I've experienced while being here at the Institute and seeing this platform um, in existence is that it's changing the culture of the Institute. And there's an interesting parallel here between publishing and academic research within the Institute. And I, expect the same thing is uh, experienced at the Omahundra Institute. So we're now much more mindful about what publishing actually is and how it should be taught and, and training of, of, of publishing. So we do a lot more work with early career historians about how to get first books published, particularly in relation to the um, RHS series. We're also thinking about writing, which um, you know, is often a, a, a miss a missed opportunity, I think, in academic teaching. We teach about how to use archives, we teach how to do research, we sometimes teach about how to publish a book, but we talk very little about the, the bit in between, the, the how to write and how to develop a work. So we developed writing workshops at the Institute. And we've also developed some um, particular uh, events which are looking at new kinds of writing uh, that are being advocated by historians um, in recent publications. So to finish, my final interlude would be to say, well, one of the benefits, I think, the positive benefits for the institutes here has been, that I think we've become more appreciative and aware of what publishing is and publishing has become more integral to the work of the institute. And I think that's important because I think there's often a tendency to see publishing as a service department, something that uh, a particular group of people do on behalf of academics. And we've learned that, you know, appreciate the labor, the skill and the judgment that goes into good publishing has made us much, work much more closely between the academic departments and the publishing departments of the Institute. And I think that's something that Karen has talked about in, in her work often. And I think it's an important development that's come out of the experience of working with the Humanities Digital Library.
So I'll stop there and I'll hand back to James. Thank you, Philip. <laughs> um, let's hand over to Tyler then. <clears throat> Thank you very much. I'm happy to be here and represent Black Perspectives and discuss the digital humanities and these public spaces a bit more. And so really quickly, for those who are not familiar with Black Perspectives, um, it's essentially a website and it's the publishing arm of the African American Intellectual History Society. And so what I wanted to talk about in the five minutes introduction here is a little bit about the experience that I've had of being a blogger for the site initially as a guest poster to now being the senior editor of the blog and kind of the ideas behind its formation and the position that it kind of holds within academia but specifically in elevating the voices of both black scholars but also scholars working on black history broadly conceived and so I started out with AAIHS as a guest blogger and I think shortly before I started contributing to it um, it was actually it, black perspectives didn't exist as we understand it today it was the african-american intellectual history society as a blog but what the founders quickly noticed and people like ibram kendi keisha blaine ashley farmer and christopher cameron realizes that the blog was becoming so popular not just amongst academics but also just general audiences um, particularly i think because of an effective social media campaign via twitter and facebook that more and more people were reading the blog, more and more people were trying to contribute to the blog and accessing it, that they decided to separate the society from the blog. But obviously they remain together, but Black Perspectives became its own entity. And it was called Black Perspectives, I think, to broaden out the framework to include both the broader diaspora, but also um, the African continent as well. So the idea here is that as I transitioned from a guest poster to a regular contributor and then the book review editor and now the senior editor of Black Perspectives, I've been able to see the methods under which it's grown and the space that it provides for people who are perhaps curious about a topic they want to write about but don't quite have enough yet for a 10,000 word peer reviewed publication, but also they want to get their ideas out for critique and helpful comment from their peers, but also the general public. So one thing that occurs relatively often, I can even speak to my own experience with this here, is we typically accept between 1,000 to 1,500 word blog posts, essays. And it typically includes a lot of hyperlinks, a lot of reference points. It doesn't necessarily need to respond to current events. It can be just a historically based form of research. But we have a variety of different methods that have been developed over time under which people can contribute to the blog. And we typically run pieces five days a week throughout the entire year with a few breaks for holidays to give the staff a break but we are completely funded by members of the african-american intellectual history society if you sign into our website we don't have advertisements that are scattered all over the page it's basically the generosity and contributions of our members including those who donate annually as well as a number of life members who have generously donated um, money for those memberships. And that's essentially what allows us to operate. The vast majority of the staff does this voluntarily. I do this voluntarily. We have some interns, which um, mostly are PhD students who are working in some format of African diaspora or African American history. And that's really what sustains us, um, including those who read the blog regularly and share it via social media. We allow people to submit guest posts. In fact, we very much invite that for people who are not regular contributors. But we also have a contingent of writers who essentially have confirmed that they're able to contribute a monthly post for us, um, with some exceptions, or at least nine months out of the year. And then we have roundtables that we hold. And if you read the blog with some regularity, you might notice what these are. These are typically uh, essays that are published consecutively throughout the week that are on a broad general theme. So one of the most recent ones we ran was on slavery and capitalism, which was about Eric Williams' contributions about capitalism and slavery. And a number of scholars uh, contributed to that. And 
many of the scholars that contributed to that particular series were um, amongst the best of their field. So what we're finding is that a number of academics at any level, which includes PhD students or graduate students, all the way up to full professors, people with endowed chairs, are reading and contributing to the blog um, with great excitement. And we're very happy to see how much it's been supported. But we also run a, a variety of series. One that we're running right now is called the Black Ecology Series. And the way that our series typically run is in distinction to the roundtables, which run consecutively throughout the week. The series is essentially posts that are contributed. And it functions maybe the way academic presses do this. So if you have the University of North Carolina Press, they have the John Hope Franklin series and certain books can be published within that series periodically. We do something similar with our blog posts. And so if you were to develop a series or contribute to one like Black Ecologies, you would submit the post and then we would schedule it for perhaps a month later um, as a piece of the series that comes out. But all of those are essentially established to have a conversation about a number of the most pressing issues within the field. And I think just to kind of remain within time to keep this relatively brief, the unique thing about the African American Intellectual History Society and then the development of Black Perspectives is that we created it, or it was created as the point of emphasis with the recognition that the digital humanities and the digital space needs to be a piece of, of academia and academic productivity in regards to writing. And with this recognition, the founders were certainly, certainly had an understanding that it needed to be adaptable. So what type of social media does need to be harnessed and used in order to get the word out about new posts or to help the society and the blog grow. And so they remain very much attached to each other as far as the AIHS and Black Perspectives. But with Black Perspectives, what we're seeing is the ability to transition into other areas in order to accumulate more readers. And also, when contributing to this blog, one thing that makes it unique is that all contributors have to be able to find a way to write for both academics as well as a general public. And they've been able to do so very effectively, and I think that explains the success and growth of the blog to this point. So with that, I'll, I'll um, listen to everybody else. Thanks, Tyler. Um, you'll have noticed I've, I've moved in my house in order to try and find some better Wi-Fi. So, um, okay, but I was listening throughout, I can promise you. That was fascinating. Um, I'm going to hand over to Cathy then. Who is muted? I've, I've done that. Thank you so much. And I want to thank everyone for inviting me to join this workshop. I've already learned a lot and um, I hope that I will have something to contribute. I'm going to talk today about my own experiences as the editor of books at the OI, um, the Omohundro Institute. When I joined the OI in 2018 as editor of books, I knew that I was taking over a story book program. Karen backed off from saying much about it, but the fact of the matter is that the books that have published, that have been published in the OI's book series have shaped the field of early American history and fields adjacent to it since before I went to college. It's, a, it's an impressive, program with very, very deep roots. Um, I also knew that I was joining an institute that under Karen's direction had begun to build a quite remarkable digital presence. Um, it was exemplified maybe most immediately to casual observers through its social media presence, but it was mo exemplified perhaps most importantly through the OI Reader, and Karen introduced you to that um, a, a few minutes ago. The question that I faced then back in 2018 and the question that I still grapple with is how to leverage the, the OI's digital platforms to enhance ongoing work in book publications and that formulation of using the digital to enhance print publication is absolutely intentional. What we're finding is that we're not seeing digital replicate or replace um, print. In fact, one of the things that I found in the course of the work that I've done for the Institute is that the scholars that I engage with, and they may admittedly be a small, um, a small and, and self-defined subset, see me definitely as an avenue to a book. People talk to me because they want to publish a book, an artifact with the Institute. Um, they want a book that is beautifully produced, that has a lovely cover, 
They want books that look like the books that we publish. To some extent, that insistence upon the book, which surprised me, they're not so interested as I thought, they're not as interested as I thought they would be in digital innovation. Some of that is driven by credentialing, by concerns about tenure, about applications for postdoctoral fellowships, concerns about landing a first, a first job. And those are all legitimate concerns. But to a, to a degree that surprised me, their aspirations were driven by the materiality of a book. They wanted actually to publish a book. And part of that may have simply to do with my own job title. I'm an editor of books, not an editor of digital publications. But I found that even projects that come to me, projects that I'm pursuing, um, that have digital research baked absolutely into the core research of the book, books that depend, for example, on digital literary analysis. Well, when I talk to those authors, what they still want to talk about is the book, the material artifact that will result from that, from um, their research. And that returns me, I guess, to the problem that I started out with. How could I harness the digital for a publication program that really does tilt insistently toward print. And here I want to use one example, um, and I'm going to share my screen and put a slide up here. Here we go. And I want to use Sophie White, who's a professor of history of Notre Dame, as an example of the one of the ways that we've found that we can both make use of our story print program, but also tie that print program to digital, digital platforms. And the particular project that we're talking about here is Sophie White's 2019 book, Voices of the Enslaved, Love, Labor, and Longing in French Louisiana. The list of prizes that the book has already accumulated, which are apparent um, visible on the slide, suggests something about the impact that this book is already having, not yet one year after its publication. For those of you who don't know anything about the book, let me tell you just a, just a, a little bit. Um, Sophie is a scholar of French Louisiana. She's a scholar of the French Atlantic. And the book, Voices of the Enslaved, of the Enslaved rests upon a remarkable archive. Sophie discovered that the, um, the legal records of colonial Louisiana included a number of trials in which enslaved and freed African descended men and women testified. Sometimes they testified because they were accused of crimes, sometimes because they were the victims of crimes, oftentimes because they had witnessed crimes. What matters here and why this book matters so much for the scholars that have read it has to do with the nature of legal practice in that time and in that place. Testimony was considered to be the queen of all proofs. And as a consequence of that, when one was called to testify in a court in French Louisiana, one's speech was transcribed with extraordinary care, with extraordinary accuracy. And because the goal was to get as much testimony out on the table as possible, men and women who testified had a remarkable platform to get their voices out and to have their speech and their thoughts and their ideas written down. What Sophie has done with this archive of testimony is to uncover literally the voices of the enslaved, considering their testimony in which they willfully redirected um, conversation away from the crime at hand toward their lives, their beliefs, toward their spirituality, toward the labor and the conditions under which they, they performed that labor into a kind of new way of thinking about the auto autobiographies and the life stories of enslaved Africans and African descended people in the French Atlantic. It's truly a remarkable sort of book. Um, Sophie wanted the book um, to be read by a larger audience than the people who would simply encounter it in the course of the OI reader. Uh, or excuse me, in the course of print publication. That was my timer going off and I'll wrap up quickly here. And this is where the OI reader comes into play. Sophie is transcribing five trials, most of which are not actually included in this book. Um, they'll be printed on the OI reader in French and in English. They'll be enhanced with photographs of the original documents, with maps and GPS, with images and sound clips as appropriate. Um, with any luck, this work will be timed 
that this project will be open access free on the free part of the OI reader, it will be time to coincide with the paperback release of Voices of the Enslaved. We're still in really early days in the planning of this. Sophie, um, who would be the first to, to admit that she has no technical skills and really a pretty limited digital imagination, and she's given me permission to share that with you, is still roughing out the plans for this on paper, and I kid you not, with a number two pencil. It hasn't yet gone to the design team, but when it does and the finished product is ready for review, it will be peer reviewed both by a, a specialist in the French Atlantic, but also by someone with digital media experience. And that is, that is essentially the result of what we've been able to do in the books program with digital media. If all goes as planned, we will have an extraordinarily small scale digital product that makes use of existing resources, Sophie's work. For relatively little investment, as these kinds of things go, we'll have an entirely new product. It will be able to reach new communities of readers. Our hope is that the trial transcripts will make a valuable contribution to classrooms. You'll be able to use it when you teach, regardless of whether or not you choose to teach and to assign Sophie's book. Um, it will um, embody all of the traditional elements um, that define uh, the elements of excellence that we associate with the OI. And hopefully, with any luck at all, Sophie's digital project, still so new it doesn't have a name, will help other scholars to imagine the ways that they can extend their research intended for print media into digital, um, into digi onto digital new, plat new digital platforms. Thank you. Thank you. And um, I can assure you, um, this isn't the only time that someone's designed a digital project with a pencil. Um, I certainly do it all the time. Um, okay, so we'll move on to our, our final speaker, James. Um, just before we do, um, just a note to everyone in the audience that if you would like to ask a question or have something bubbling up, please do stick it in the chat and I will um, aim to assemble some of those as we go along because we've got plenty of time, it looks like, to have a discussion. But I'll pass over to James for the final five minutes. You're muted. Okay, I, I, I want to start by thanking my colleagues at the Institute for Historical Research and at Omohundro for inviting me. Uh, the American Historical Association, and I'm the executive director, uh, is a publisher, but we're not primarily a publisher. So I'm here mostly to learn, which is why I especially appreciate the invitation to participate. Uh, it's a large group here. I don't know how, and I, since it's uh, Transatlantic. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the AHA. The American Historical Association is the largest organization of professional historians in the world. Uh, we have 11,500 members. We publish the American Historical Review, Perspectives on History, which has a paper version and a uh, actually daily online version. Uh, we publish booklets, which we used to call pamphlets and all sorts of materials at our website for people who work as historians in all sorts of venues, whether teaching, uh, museums, archives, uh, wherever people teach history, uh, wherever people present history to all sorts of publics, uh, we have stuff that can help. Uh, and I want to emphasize that most of this work is collaborative in one way or another. Uh, including the central role of different kinds of editors. As an example, uh, every article in Perspectives on History uh, has essentially had uh, an acquisitions process, developmental editing, in-house peer review, and copy editing. And I, I emphasize this to give, to provide some sense uh, to people who have not been part of a process like this, that first of all, all publication, if it's done well, is collaborative. And second of all, quite frankly, all publication, uh, if it's done well, uh, this collaboration is, uh, takes resources. And it's important to realize that. So the main role for the American Historical Association in what we're discussing today is to provide an arena for thinking about the issues that you've already been hearing about, but also the advocacy necessary to promote uh, different kinds of scholarship 
and to legitimate newer kinds of scholarship. Uh, obviously, the standard book, and I, I actually generally don't use the word monograph, the standard book that historians write, uh, we don't need to legitimate that anymore. Uh, but there's all sorts of new stuff that we've been hearing about for the last half hour uh, that need to be, believe it or not, uh, legitimated in academic contexts in terms of promotion and tenure. And this is one of the things that the AHA does, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, we also have the ability to convene. We also have the ability to inspire. And these are the, this is the leverage that the AHA brings to the table. So for example, and this would be in some ways the power to convene um, because that convening can be around something that you publish or inspire. Uh, the editor of Perspectives uh, writes a monthly column and the November column, which actually goes online in October, uh, will be about the relationship between digital dissemination and digital methods or digital thinking. And what her argument is, which is, is provocative to some, is that these are not the same thing. Uh, she uses the metaphor of all squares are rectangles, all squares are rectangles, but not all rectangles are squares. And in thinking about what do we mean by digital history or digital humanities in a larger context, uh, as opposed to, or yeah, as opposed to uh, digital dissemination, these are not the same term. These are not the same things, the same concepts, the same terms. And her very short editor's column in October uh, very provocatively poses this question. And this is the sort of thing that we do. We are much better at posing questions, at raising issues, quite frankly, than we are at providing answers. Uh, now, one exception to that is that it is our role to provide uh, ethical guidelines for the discipline of history. And as the discipline of history comes to encompass more types of publications, we have to broaden our scope uh, in terms of ethical guidelines in, as we practice history. Uh, but we also, and this goes back to our legitimation leverage, we do publish things that say, this is legitimate history. We do take a position on that. And the, for the purposes of this conversation, what's most important is our guidelines for the evaluation of digital scholarship. Uh, and you can find this, uh, someone can probably quickly pop this up in the, in the chat. I'll, I'll do it after I finish. Uh, but we have published a five page document that a department chair can wave in front of a dean when a faculty member comes up for tenure or promotion with primarily digital publications and say, my professional association, my scholarly society says this is real scholarship. And if the dean is a chemist, uh, that can be very helpful. Uh, so this is the sort of thing that we can do. We can advocate the work that's being described here, the kind of publication that Kathy talked about, uh, the kinds of publication that Tyler is talking about, we need to be able to say to our colleagues as historians and to our administrators, this is legitimate scholarship. And this is the role that the AHA can play. Uh, we also do publish uh, Perspectives Online is, uh, uh, is, is actually daily. And we've experimented recently, for example, we've never done anything this fast. We put something up yesterday on the election of 1800. Uh, those of you who are not historians of the United States, uh, all I can say very quickly is the outcome of the election of 1800 was expected to be contested. Uh, the incumbent president lost. Uh, he despised the man he was running against. He didn't trust him and he stepped down voluntarily. Uh, we think this is important right now. And so we published this yesterday. Uh, we literally commissioned it on Thursday or Friday uh, and it's written by the editor of the Adams Papers, probably the most qualified person in the world to write something like this. Uh, so this is something new that we're experimenting with. We also publish booklets. Uh, we publish uh, booklets that we can publish as paper, as PDFs, and also then as separable pieces. And if you look for our career for history majors, careers for history majors online, you'll see the way we're trying to experiment with publishing things uh, in different ways with, with different access points. Uh, the other thing that we do here, or one of the other things in terms of digital publication that we're experimenting with, again, thinking about last minute, 
is when everybody went online in March, we scratched our heads and said, how can we best serve our members? And what we realized was that we could best serve our members by providing them with online materials that they were suddenly gonna have to use. There are lots of people who've been using stuff that's online, but there are thousands of historians uh, who have never done this before. <laughs> They've never taught remotely. They've never thought about, create, how they, about creative ways of using digitized materials, primary and secondary. So we've created something called the Remote Teaching Resource. And my colleague, uh, Maureen Elgersman Lee, is here uh, among, the, um, among the audience for this. And she's one of our researchers for this. And what we're doing, Maureen is, is one of the people who is doing a peer review of these materials. These are all vetted. Everything that you see on our remote teaching resource, if you're a teacher, high school, college, and you need stuff, you can be sure that what you find at the AHA website has been vetted, has been peer reviewed, and therefore is usable. Uh, so what we're interested in is thinking about the different ways of doing things. You don't always have to do something in the way that is cutting edge. You want to do some, you want to do, we're, our notion is that it's legitimate to practice history in a wide variety of ways. As our uh, managing editor puts it, and I should say she is an alum of William and Mary, uh, not everything needs to be a special app. And I'm plagiarizing from her directly. Uh, and this is important for us. We look at something and we say, what's the best way to do this? And one of the advantages that we have is we have such a variety of venues. Uh, one other experiment I can quickly talk about is we have something new in the back of our Perspectives magazine called Everything Has a History. And what we've asked is historians, and please, everybody who's here, if you have an idea, contact us. We've asked historians to say, tell us about an object that you find fascinating. Uh, this month, it's a pith helmet. Last month, it was a frog. Uh, tell us about an object that you find fascinating and give us 500 words. Why is it fascinating? Why is this an important piece of material culture? Because everything has a history. This goes back to the original, one of the original topics for this conversation is what are the limitations when you're small and sometimes your imagination outruns your resources. Karen and I have talked about this frequently. So here's a situation where what we like to do is to take this image and rotate it like one would as if it were a museum exhibit online, but it costs too much money. So we haven't done it yet. We'll figure out how to do it. But these are the kinds of challenges, these are the ways in which it's important to say, our imagination runs here, we can't get all the way there, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't do it. And that's what we're trying to do with this Everything Has a History. Uh, I wanna emphasize in terms of thinking about these different ways of publicizing our work. Uh, Philip early talked, earlier talked a little bit about the importance of writing. And Tyler was talking about the importance of the, of the African-American Intellectual History Society blog as reaching uh, general audiences. Uh, I want to emphasize that when we think about digital publication and its relationship to other forms, that we need to remember that historians can write for everyone. Unlike scientists, we don't need translators. And I think this was actually when we think one of the things in terms of thinking about the about new digital scholarship, new digital methods and text mining. Uh, one of the mistakes I think that happened in the 70s with quantitative history was the methods became so fascinating that the prose became less important. Uh, and the work was fabulous, but in some ways it didn't go anywhere because the writing was a little dry. Uh, Philip reported to the, referred to the importance of writing in our work as historians, and many of us who teach history actually do teach writing, and we emphasize to our students the importance of writing. And I never have told a student they're writing a dissertation, they're writing a book. And the AHA's position right now is that we're in a brave new world in terms of the number of ways of reaching various publics. 
Thank you very much. The night. Oh, we should, we should have a clap. Uh, the, the nice thing about the word time is that it's easier to write backwards on a piece of paper, I just realised. So that, that's a good, good tip for term. But, um, but, then, but then it becomes emit. <laughs> um, thank you, everyone. And, and thanks particularly to, to Jim for, um, for summarising much of what um, our panellists have spoken about. We have about 25 minutes remaining and we have a number of questions already um, in the chat. So I'm keen to get to those um, soon. Um, from my perspective, there are a few themes that I thought were really interesting that came through. Um, themes to do with what we learn from small initiatives, what we learn about publishing in particular. Um, themes to do with perhaps what we might call sort of boutique digital, I guess, in a way, and how we think about designing them from the ground up. Um, and themes to do with what scholarship um, actually is, I guess. Um, themes as well, I, I really enjoyed the phrase um, that Tyler used about a point of emphasis and themes about how we write in terms of our points of emphasis as well. Um, and themes about labour perhaps as well. Um, I want to ask, start by asking the panel a question. You don't all have to answer um, this question, but a, but a simple one really, well, maybe a simple question, um, which is to do with that thing about um, considerations of design. So thinking about the, um, the initiatives you've been involved with or the initiatives you've, you've started, what was the first thing that went into the design of that digital initiative? What was the kind of the primary consideration at the start of that process for you? Well, I can, I can say very briefly that uh, the OI reader was a response to a couple of different things. And one was the fact that we had, of course, like many um, organizations, we were grappling with um, how to represent digital humanities work within what was a very traditional publisher's workflow. Um, and we had about 10 years of experience of doing what I think parents of toddlers will recognize as uh, parallel play. Essentially, we had um, the print version happening over here, and then we had a kind of digital, what we would call a digital supplement <laughs> over on our website. And some of those digital supplements were quite um, impressive and uh, sophisticated for their time, but they were, it wasn't an integrated presentation. And as we all know, a lot of digital research and digital presentation is actually inherent to the argument. It's not just a parallel piece. It's not a supplement. It isn't, you know, in the kind of old school way of uh, using an illustration, not because you're analyzing it, but just <laughs> for something else to look at. So we really wanted a platform where we could integrate these things. But as we looked around at what was available, we thought, well, if we were an organization, um, we were very lucky to have some resources to do this, but if we were an organization without any resources, wouldn't we want to use something that was kind of out of the box? Wouldn't we try to do something relatively lightweight? So we wanted to bring together um, digital work and we wanted to do something out of the box. And that's what we did both times, both with Adobe and with the WordPress site. We wanted, you know, we're, we didn't want a kind of super elaborate gazillion dollar custom build. We wanted something that could be doable by others frankly, um, and something where we could potentially host other materials, but without, without anything too, too elaborate. So that, that was a beginning point for us. And James, maybe as, as, as somebody else who's worked on a project, um, I think the starting point for the Humanities Digital Library was very definitely um, the need for Open, the open access dimension from the RHS, the Royal Historical Society, was paramount. Um, a, a platform that could cope with uh, the chapter level um, servicing that is integral to the kind of publishing that we do as a sort of publisher of essay collections and so on. Um, I think it's also worth mentioning that there's lots of positives that we can talk about. And in my short presentation, I sort of emphasize the importance of, of the development to the thinking of it, the Institute, and that, that's very important. But there are also many challenges. So I think in the last couple of years, we've, we've experienced many limitations with the platform that we didn't think about, that our thinking has evolved in the last two or three years in terms of what we want to do and realize that we are running up against technological uh, boundaries that we need to either find funding for or time for. And that's, a, that's an important element, I think, in this discussion. I'm seeing in the chat lots of conversation about discoverability and sustainability. And I think sustainability of a platform that can move with what you want to do, often in quite small steps, is important and is a challenge to the success of a publishing entity. So I think it's 
I think it's both a, the, the, your question is interesting in terms of a starting point, but also it's, it's, it's what you then realize subsequent to the thing when it's up and running um, that you wish you had known about when you were starting out, I think is important. I'm going to come in there then, I think, move on to one of the questions. Well, uh, two questions came in, one from Anne, one from Patrick, which were kind of related to that point of sustainability. And I, I'd wonder if the other the other panellists would like to make a comment on it, which is to do with really that, I guess, a sense in both the comments that authors worry about the sustainability of some platforms um, and they worry about the survivability, the other word being used. Um, and. I guess the question really here is not so much about this group to really say, well, you know, how do we make stuff sustainable? Because people in digital preservation know how to make stuff sustainable. I think the question for this panel is more about, you know, what is it we articulate to our audiences about the likely survivability of the things that they write? Um, and is it important, you know, is the aim here for us as historians to say, well, we should only ever publish things that in theory can last forever. And of course, books don't last forever, but librarians do a great job at it, right? Um, what is it we should be doing with these kind of smaller projects, I guess, where we, we, we get across to our audiences and our readers that are our authors that, yeah, this thing might only last 10 years, but how can we kind of make the case for something that only lasts a small period of time? Because as I often say, you know, all websites should die. That's their job. They're not supposed to be there forever. So how do we get that across to audiences? What conversations have you had, maybe the other panelists, um, with, with authors about the relative likelihood that their work will, will survive for the long term? Let me, let me jump in quickly. Um, first of all, I would, I, I, I'm going to push back a little bit. I never use the word all and should in the same sentence. And I think that's the whole point here is that uh, in terms of sustainability, one needs to think about what's the purpose of what you're creating and how does that purpose relate to time? So for example, if we're talking about dissemination of historical knowledge and thinking rather than the word publication, just for a second, a conference session or a discussion like this uh, is in a sense a form of dissemination. Uh, sometimes it shouldn't be taped. There are some, you know, th this obsession with taping things is a problem because sometimes you want to have a conversation where you want people to be freer to exercise their sense of humor, to take risks, and they shouldn't be taped. Well, in that case, it's totally non not a sustainable form of dissemination. It's a conversation that happens in one place and that's productive and it's useful. So I, I think that one has to think about the relationship between how one is disseminating knowledge and what the uses of that dissemination are, and that helps you think about sustainability. Thanks, Jim. Does any other panelists have a comment on sustainability at all? Because there is a link here to one of the other questions, but I'm happy for you to, um, to add anything if you'd like to. I'll, I'll be very brief. Um, I mean, I know that the the web designer and the person who upkeeps it could probably give a very good answer on preserving <laughs> all of the content. But uh, one thing I would say is that, and I, I emphasize it in my, my intro, is that this website was established to be enduring and it was made not just on a whim, but with the idea that this process would continue for at least as long as the internet exists. I mean, it doesn't mean it doesn't change, it doesn't mean it doesn't evolve, but there is certainly an idea that many of the things that are posted, and I can speak to my own experience, is that a lot of these pieces will live on in some way. I mean, a piece that I published on Black Perspectives talking about tuition for universities during Reconstruction, that's now coming out as a peer-reviewed publication. So even if that disappears at some point, it will, it will live on as a, you know, a piece of something else. And many of the contributions we get are, are pieces of scholars' larger projects that they think aren't getting read widely enough. And so they use our platform to at least introduce it to a wider readership uh, through the digital platform. And if it disappears, and hopefully it doesn't, but if it does, it still lives on in some form. And I think that's been the, the great utility of what Black Perspectives has offered for both scholars and just people interested in history in general. Thanks. So that, that connects to one of the other questions in the chat, I guess, in a way, which is from Laura, which is to do with discoverability. Um, I was I was kind of 
struck um, whilst Jim was speaking about the fact that um, a lot of people in, in preservation world will often say, well, you know, preservation is only worth doing if preservation can be made in a way that people can use it. Um, and so that, that connection between use and preservation, I think is incredibly important and that connects with discoverability. Um, Laura's question really is about the issues that Philip mentioned about discoverability and the fact that there are so many great resources out there, but it's often hard to find them. And I guess I'm struck here by the fact that we have one long standing infrastructure for discoverability, which is our libraries, and they're a fantastic way of creating discoverability. And then we have this other very new um, infrastructure of discoverability, which is the web and any kind of search platforms through that. Um, and that sometimes those things don't join up, and sometimes some of the projects we're talking about today can fall between those things. Um, so I wonder if, if and the panel have any comments about the relationship between the kind of publication ventures that you're you're engaged in and ensuring the discoverability of them um, to audiences who who might on one hand always go to the library for stuff and might on the other hand always go just to the general web for stuff and how we kind of we, we kind of strike a balance between those two different types of types of audiences go on Cara. well I mean, dis discoverability is a, you know, a, a particular specialty um, for library science um, and information science more generally. So I am not trained in that. Um, and so I'm speaking from the position of a publisher, scholar, researcher, reader. Um, but I think, you know, the evidence shows that um, even researcher, scholar, readers are finding more and more even inter in library content through basic um, web searches now. That is that the kind of um, discoverability that would lead you to materials that are held within a library, either its own collections or its licensed collections are actually now taking place on the web. So the kind of search engine optimization that we would be looking for, which is part of why I said we transition to, to this web-based app, which is you know, permeable in a way that our, our reader app was not, um, is extremely important and to be thinking about SEO all the time now. Um, I don't know what the end point of that um, convergence is going to be, but I suspect that our library colleagues would say that the end point of, um, that the desirable end point is that you can discover as much in library content through a general web search as you can um, from the from the uh, the search inside the library, and that's certainly how researchers are already already behaving. So, I'd like to flip that question a little bit um, and go back to the conversation that, that I think really Tyler was emphasizing in terms of uh, public audiences and public readerships. And I think what we what we're looking at here is is a teaching issue. We need, we need to be thinking about this as history teachers as well as history publishers. And when I was in college uh, in the early 1970s, uh, my professors taught me how to find things. That's what, that's what you learned in a history class was how to find stuff. And what we need to be doing now as history professors uh, and working with librarians, no matter what discipline we're in, is teaching our students how to sift stuff. So discoverability in that sense has different angles to it that are extremely important. Uh, so that's part of it. The second is there's a, a web literacy that we need to teach our students uh, in order for them to be smart discoverers. I did a workshop once where I asked a bunch of historians, how many of you know how Google chooses to put the things on your front page when you start a search? and two people raised their hand. So we had a room filled with people who were teaching students critical thinking and critical use of sources, and they had absolutely no idea how they were starting to do a research project. So I, I think that we need to, when we think about discoverability, we need to think about it not only from the perspective of ourselves as publishers, but how can we contribute to literate and thoughtful discover, discovering by our readers. I think our silence in our sense is that we're all agreeing with you there, Jim. Um, I also think the two people who put their hand up claiming that they knew how Google worked weren't probably telling the truth either. Um, so, <laughs> um, so anything else to say on, on discoverability? Because there's a, there's a kind of linkage to some of the other questions as well that are coming up. 
I'll, I'll say a real quick statement. Um, this is appropriate, I guess, because I, I actually published a piece in Black Perspectives, and, and this is the point about teaching, uh, to see if I could create an entire introductory course on African American history using digital sources. And mm -hmm. I think I successfully did so, at least my students seem to believe so. On the one hand, it was affordable for them because all the content was free and available online. But the other was to encourage students to understand that the website is a space that is new for everybody, despite even if you grew up with it, it is something that is unprecedented in world history with the access to knowledge, but not all of that knowledge is particularly good knowledge. And so the idea behind the course was at least in part to introduce students to websites where they could find premier scholarship that was available to them because there still is a stereotype that's carried amongst academia or, with, or about academics and that we kind of contain all of our information to ourselves. But what we're finding, particularly within the Black Perspectives platform, is encouraging historians and scholars of Black studies to write for a general public that's accessible in its prose, but also in its scale and ability to reach different audiences. And so the students were fascinated that they were reading premier scholarship that was literally available at their keyboard. So it goes into this teaching and scholarship model um, that was that was referenced, I think is important. And so if anyone's interested in reading that, it is available on Black Perspectives as a model for how people can formulate these courses in the future. Cool. Um, thank you for that. So, so while we're on the kind of um, expectations, perhaps, of, I mean, we'll, we'll categorize students as younger people for now. So while we're on the expectations of younger people, there's a couple of questions that have come in the chat which had to do with things beyond text. So audio and video, and the extent to which um, videos are a, a way in which many young people, many all of us maybe consume, consume history, podcasts being a way in which many people um, consume history. Also a question slightly moving aside from that around data and the extent to which data is a way in which we might consume history in the sense of publishing um, data and finding ways which historians might publish that. Um, and there's also a question in the chat which is related to that which should do with some of the challenges of the digital in relation to the audiovisual. Um, so in particular a question from Sam which is about images and the fact that um, in many cases trying to get image rights that kind of stuff in relation to um, an innovative digital platform can be quite um, complicated. Um, and as someone who, who has a background in kind of in, in, a, in the study of the printed image, I've certainly um, sympathize um, with that. I would say that my trick basically was always to just provide links to stuff um, if I could trust those links as a provide, as, instead of actually providing the images themselves. Um, but I wonder if we could stick to that first point for now, which is to do with audiovisual. Um, we've spoken almost entirely today, or on the assumption today, I think, that everything we're talking about is textual. Um, and I wonder if anyone would like to speak to maybe why it is that we're doing that with our publishing initiatives through our societies. Um, and that thinking particularly about the kind of different audiences thing, what do we think about the, the consumption of video, the consumption of audio um, within the context of um, sort of new historical scholarship? James, I'll, I'll jump in there if I may. And actually, I'm going to suggest that Karen speaks to that because I mean, I think something like the OI Reader is a really good example of, of a first initiative in that. Um, I, I, think, I think it's a real challenge to do that. And I think there are two, two elements to, 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 the, to the question that you're identifying is what is being done and then how are people engaging with that and how will history, how we communicate history, what we write, what we choose to write, how will that develop? Um, so I wonder if, if Karen might, speak to some of the early experiences of the OI reader where that where visual and audio is integral to that model in a way that it, it, it isn't seen in forms of publishing that, for example, we're doing at the Institute at the moment. If you don't mind, I'm going to um, phone a friend here. My, uh, my colleague, Josh Piker, the editor of the Quarterly is actually here somewhere. And I think, uh, I think Josh, I say somewhere, he's here virtually, right, with all of us, but I know, he, I know he's in attendance. Um, I don't know if Josh is able to um, yeah. unmute. Yeah, sorry, Karen. I was actually I'm here. Perfect. I'm making lunch. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Well, I Perfect. Talk, but Josh is positioned to speak. I to am him. multi multi multitasking here. Um, <laughs> so one of the things we wanted to do with the putting the William Mary Quarterly on the OI Reader was allow images and video to live within the articles. 
right? That they are not just things you click to, that these are things that have a life within the journal, within the scholarship, um, which is something very challenging to do, of course, in a, in a print medium. Uh, in doing that, we're hoping that the process will make the, 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 the sort of interactability, interactability, the interactiveness of these um, videos and images will make the articles more accessible to a wider range of, of uh, readers, you know, uh, of students perhaps. So the, um, the Born Digital piece that uh, Karen showed from Simon Newman um, is truly an interactive experience, right? You, um, videos, images populate with, with other images. Uh, there's lots of sound, uh, there are lots of videos. Um, so we hope that will make it teachable. Um, I'm also though, frankly, hoping that by having images and video and such live within articles, we can do what my colleague Kathy Kelly was gesturing at almost an hour ago now, and that is to encourage scholars to do more with these things, to think more creatively about how we can change the forms of our scholarship by using the digital, that we can ask more of our scholarship. We, it's not just a matter of getting, using the digital, using video and images, to get eyes, to get readers. It's a matter of doing something different. The, the, the digital has transformative possibility for us, not just as disseminators, but as thinkers uh, and as people who make arguments. Um, and so we're hoping the OI reader will allow us to do that as well. And if I can, if, if I can hop on to that, is that allowed, James? Okay, yay, okay, great. In fact, I think what's so important with some of these early pieces from my perspective that are coming out on the OI Reader, are not just the things that Josh just summed up so nicely, but that I can point to those things in the OI Reader, and particularly Simon Newman's Hidden in Plain Sight article, and I can show them to a historian like Sophie, and she sees them, she's seeing them anyway, she's reading them, and they exemplify a way to begin to think about how you can marry the kind of archival work you're already doing, you're already steeped in, the kind of textual production that you're steeped in, and marry that with other kinds of digital technologies to reach new audiences. It really does, it, it is critically inspirational. And I found it to be, in, I found it to be really helpful in the conversations that I'm having with authors down the pike, so. Thanks so much. And, and you, you both made me think of another institute, which um, is doing some great work actually with audiovisual, which is the um, Paul Mellon Center for Studies in British Art. Um, and I can't find the link, but I'll post it when I, when I find it in a minute, which is British Art Studies has some really, really lovely audiovisual essays, which are not sort of just journal articles which are read out, but have a really kind of um, sensible and sort of um, intellectually grounded audio visualness, which works really, really well. Um, we only have a couple of minutes left, but I do want to, seen as Kathy um, mentioned, seen as Kathy kind of jumped in there, um, one of the questions of the chat from Kate, which I'd just like to kind of um, finish on, which is to do with um, data. Um, and I'll read the question out. It says, what are your thoughts on the role of scholarly publishers in publishing uninterpreted historical data? Um, that has been collected by historians in the course of their research. And I guess the question here is about that kind of pairing of things. So we've already mentioned sort of video and audio with text. And what are your thoughts really then about how we integrate um, sources and compilations of sources into the publishing work that we do and what role can institutes have um, in promoting the kind of the sharing, I guess, of the compilations of things that we find in, in, the, in the form of data? You know, this is nothing new. Um, I hate to say it, Fogel and Engerman did this uh, in their book on slavery. And, and actually I did this with my first book back in the late 1980s. Before publishing the book, I actually edited a complete, uh, a complete microfilm collection of 50 to 60% of my primary sources. So this is something that actually historians have done in the past. And I think what the digital environment does is it gives us an opportunity to do more of it and to do more with quantitative data. Uh, so that anybody working with quantitative data uh, by putting it up on the web can in essence enable other people to manipulate that data the way they want. I mean, this is what makes us different from scientists in some ways, right? We don't, we don't worry about whether someone 
uh, gets to our data first or second or third because the writing matters. Uh, so it seems to me that this is kind of a no-brainer for us in terms of uh, all of us should be thinking about ways of sharing uh, as openly as possible all of the sources that we use for our books and articles and digital publications. And the AHA is happy to help with that if there's anybody who thinks that we need to do something to make that easier. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't, I can't speak to this yet because we're, we're not in a, we're still in a confidential stage, but, um, but we're actually, uh, the, with the quarterly, Josh is, um, partnering with a new journal, a new online journal of data sets, um, and we're about to start a kind of collaborative project together um, to look at how that journal is thinking about publishing data sets and what we can learn from them and what they can learn from us. I mean, it is a little like I think about how much we have already learned from AIHS and Black Perspectives and their innovative path forward. Um, and, you know, it's the same kind of thing. So I think there's a tremendous future for publishing humanities data. The other thing that I think is important, um, I mean, as Jim said, you know, uh, historians have been making data public for a long time. It's just not quite the same as scientists who put a bunch of stuff on Figshare or, or whatever and who have these data sets that are monstrous. I did a presentation for, for NISO earlier this year, back when we were all in person, where I talked about um, scale, again, that sometimes when scientists are talking about publication of data sets and these issues, they're talking about can, you know, do we have enough computing in the universe to store the size data sets that we have? And we're talking about a data set that I can put on, a, easily put on a thumb drive. But the, the, um, the insights that we bring to questions of data sets are critically important actually for those people who have a universe sized data set because they're about ethical, humane, critical inquiry. It's the same kind of perspective on how is data gathered? What is, of what is data constituted? What are the situations in which it was described in which we have now, what kind of container we have now put it in? And I use the example of Slave Voyages, the great database of, um, of slave ships that um, a generation now of exceptional scholars really, for me anyway, starting with Stephanie Smallwood, began to get a purchase on how um, that, I'll just say unintentionally, um, of course unintentionally, but how reproducing those data sets can reproduce the very violence of commodification of slave trade. Um, so I think, you know, we have a lot to bring. Humani humanists, historians in particular, have a lot to bring to the study of data sets and to thinking about capturing data in our scholarship, speaking to and about um, data. And I'm really looking forward to this collaboration that, um, that Josh is going to helm for the quarterly. And I think it's really important you mentioned that as we get to time, Karen, because one of the things you said right at the beginning is that what we shouldn't be doing as historians is trying to um, sort of upscale from STEM into what we do, and we should be right-sizing for ourselves. And Jim's quite right that, um, yeah, historians have been publishing data for a while. One of the implications of the question um, was that actually many of us don't share our data. And I guess one of the things maybe we can take from this um, discussion is that the role of, of institutes as publishers is to help the profession learn more broadly about the way in which we have been doing things in the past, the ways individual people are doing small activities which we can learn from, um, but also the ways in which we can educate our colleagues outside of um, history on some of the particular skills that we bring to things um, in relation to publishing. Um, we are over time, um, but only by about um, three minutes. So I think that's probably um, the time to close. Um, there are a number of questions in the chat, some of which I haven't got to fully. So um, if any of the panelists um, want to see um, the text chat afterwards and might want to um, think about some of those things, um, then they'll be able to. So some of you might get a, a message um, from one of the panelists. Um, but I'm gonna suggest that um, we leave it there. But before we do, we um, thank our panel. Um, I'm gonna ask as many of you in the audience as possible, if you could unmute at this point and actually clap um, rather than merely um, do a little Zoom clap because I think that'd be nice, wouldn't it? Fantastic, I miss rounds of applause. All the kind of the panel shows don't have them anymore. So I think it's important. Um, Anyway, um, thank you to our, our wonderful panelists and um, thank you so much to everyone attended and 
provided so many kind of interesting and insightful questions. Hopefully, um, this collaboration will mean we can do more of such these such events in the future. So thank you, everyone. Goodbye.